Hello, everyone. What up? So you know who I am. No, you don't. I'm Lynn Dowie Davis. I'm your moderator for today. And this is Stefan Bristol. So, Stefan, how are you feeling? Good. Yeah? I feel real good. It's good to see you. Uh it's good to see y'all, and this is blessed to be here. It's my third time in this building. Um, very blessed and unheard of to be speaking um, in the same building three times. So that's that's a blessing. Absolutely. Did all of you enjoy the film? So I'm going to take a moment, take a moment to read a few things, a few things from Brooklyn, Caribbean roots. Okay. <laughs> Um, you've received two nominations for Best Feature Film and Best First Screenplay for Independent Spirit Awards. You co-wrote the script. Yes. Um, With a black woman. Come on. Spike Lee is your mentor. And this was originally a short film. Yeah. Okay, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm trying, I think we're trying to get on your level here. Um, so talk to us a little bit about how you even got to this place of combining all of these beautiful elements of black students, geniuses, right? Um, they're here in New York, um, they're in a Caribbean neighborhood, and then you've got this overarching arc of police brutality. How did you want to bring, how did you bring all of those elements together? Um, you know, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, uh, Coney Island to be exact. Uh, you know, during that time it was a rough neighborhood but me and my friends, you know, we weren't of um, those dangerous elements of those neighborhoods, you know what I'm saying? It was more of um, always going to the comic book short stores or, you know, geeking out over video games. And um, growing up, when you see, you know, films of black teenagers, it's always about, you know, black teens being in, in gang, gang members or, you know, dealing with drugs. And I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to make a film like that for my first feature film. Right. So, you know, during the time when I needed to do a, a, a film for NYU, um, I had a, uh, I had a family member who was an alcoholic, and for me to cope with that, I was just watching Back to the Future on repeat. <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I decided to make. Uh, you know, a story about a kid who was trying to go back in time to stop, you know, his father from being a drunk driver and killing okay. somebody. Unfortunately, it was the summer when Mark, um, Eric Garner got murdered. Oh, my. And during that summer, um, that murder bled into my script. And I just, you know, I brought it to my professor. I said, hey, bam, black teens building time machines, going back in time to save a lot. What's up? And she was like, I love the idea, but there's a scene of police brutality in here. Um, and, you know, you're, you're making light of the situation. Right. So if you want, you know, the story to work, you either take that out or make that the story. I was like, well, that's a brilliant idea. So I ran with it uh, because dealing with the subject matter of time travel and you know, going in loops, that's what time travel is really. Right. Um, and I just, you know, unfortunately, I remember... Amadou Diallo, I remember Sean Bell, uh, I remember um, learning school by Emmett Till. So if young black men is, have been repeatedly murdered in history, unfortunately it's gonna happen again. And what happened after Eric Garner? Lionel Castile, thing. Sandra Bland, and they kept going. So I decided to make that story. When you think about the time machine, is that a way to kind of cope with feeling helpless? Uh, that's a good question. I just wanted to have some fun. Okay. <laughs> to be honest, with you, I just never seen black people do time travel before. Okay. Um, and I remember there was a mo there's a TV show called Timeless. Yes. And one of the black characters said, "There's never a moment in our history I could go back and 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 be safe." Um, and and unfortunately, there's no moment in history today that we could go back and be safe. Right. So I just wanted to show a different side of what black life is like. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so you you make the short film. It garners a certain amount of success and attention. And then Spike Lee pops out and he says, "Okay, I want to 
produced the movie. What do you do with that information? <laughs> he didn't necessarily, it, it sounded like it popped up, but this, uh, he didn't necessarily pop up. I went, um, when I met Spike, I went to the best college in the United States of America. That's Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia, HBCU, Spelman, right across the street, Clark AU. Come on. Um, <laughs> And I met him there, and I chased after him three times to get an internship. Okay. And then when I got to NYU, thankfully, um, he, he wrote me a letter of recommendation for NYU. Um, I asked him, hey, Spike, I want you to be my mentor. And he said, yeah, I got you. And he's been, you know, saw my films, cussing me out, pushing me, making sure I was able to, <laughs> you know, be a good filmmaker. Um, he sponsored my short film um, through his production grant. Um, also, who else, who else sponsored my short film was my mom, who refinanced a home. Amazing. Um, the sponsor, yeah, so I'd be able to graduate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and by the time he, you know, he saw the short, he loved it. He knew I was working on it for years. Um, so he said, Stuff, I know you've been working on this movie. I, wanna, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Let me come on as your producer. Think about it. I say, motherfucker, ain't no time to think about <laughs> shit. Let's go. <laughs> today. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, let's do it today. And he has been the best producer um, in, as any filmmaker can ask for. He's fought for me a lot of times, you know. What's, I, I imagine there must have been a lot of nuggets, right? Pieces of advice that he must have given to you. Don't you fuck up. D okay. <laughs> Aside from don't fuck up, um, <laughs> do you have two other tips that you can kind of share with this amazing audience that's here today? Um, from Spike? From Spike. Uh, it was mostly, honestly, it's mostly about from writing. He, you know, he trusted me on, on you know, directing. Because um, he's, you know, I was surprised he was hardly on set. So, you know, he was just there from day one with the writing. And you know he just challenged me on the dialogue, you know he challenged me on on some plot points, and you know he he's you know he said, man, just go with your gut and make the film you want to make, you know, and that was it. So pivoting just a moment here to talk about creative process, right? What is your process like? What what do you do? You get this idea in your mind, and it's so deeply rooted into your heart right now that you can't see anything else. What's the first thing that you do? I seek help. Honestly, you know, of course, I went to Spike, given my a script. Um, you know, I had two close friends of mine who was working on the short. I had to fire them because they weren't doing great. And I broke down and I started all over again. I cried for like a week, started over again. Um, I just sought help for people who believed in me. Um, and I sought help um, that I know people would push me. Um, of course, Spike would push me, but also my professors at NYU would push me. Um, and dealing with a black woman on the screen who's a lead character, I had to make sure I hired a black woman to help me co-write. So I actively saw her. And from the short to the feature, you know, we just bounce ideas. And I just ask everybody, I need you to be completely 120% honest with me. If this shit is trash, let it be known because I want to make this right. Were there, I don't, I don't want to use the word fights, but there were there many disagreements around the writing room, around the table, around changes that were happening? And how did you kind of manage that as you were trying to get to the finished product that we see here now? Um, it weren't, at initially, at first, at first, there was no fights between Frederica and I or Spike. We all knew what film we was trying to make. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, the first fight is when I brought it to Netflix. Okay. Uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't a bad fight. I'm not trying to, you know, you know, Make anything bad about it. Netflix been great. Right. Um, it's just that you know when you have a lot of we have more people in the room that's passionate about the project. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a disagreement. So the, you know it was a big it was one big fight about the idea of time travel, and I just want to keep it simple as possible because you know there's a lot of bullshit about the time travel in the movie, but that's not the point. The point is, is about this family and what they're going through, and I I want to make sure that the time travel wasn't diluted and you'll be distracted by the story of this family. So. Talking, shifting just a bit, okay, let's dig in a little bit more to the filmmaking side of things. What did you know that was true about filmmaking before you started this project, and what's true to you now? Wow. Um, before I started this project, uh, people don't know what they're doing. 
And afterwards, people still don't know what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> 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 um, myself included. Like, when I, um, before, you know, it's the writing of the script was all trial and error. And, and the toughest part is learning how to direct actors. Um, I thought I knew because I had training before. Right. But it, you're, you're not in it until you're on set. And you're trying to hide... <laughs> you're trying to hide the bullshit from your actors, but actors are like lie detectives. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My my biggest regret was not breaking down my script because I wrote the script. You know, you think right. I know everything about it. Nah, I wish I broke that motherfucker down. Right. And so every time I show up on set, I know exactly, you know, the scene before, the scene after, the spine, everything. You know, every morning I have to waste time going through the script again, writing it down, and you know, and I worry about the crew. Uh, my my uh, DP say, "Wait, what? Put the camera hold on a second. I have to I have to talk to my actress real quick." Right. And you know, I have to go and it, it's just it's I'm flustered, and I wish I broke the I broke the script down beforehand. Um, what I learned after production, I go into the 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 um, edit room. Man, I learned you could change performances like a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that helped. I really had a great, great editor. Uh, shout out to Jennifer Lee. Um, you know, she, yeah, she whipped my ass. You know, she, you know, she was like a big sister to me. She, you know, she put, dealt with my bullshit. She called me out on my bullshit, and she challenged me on the um, on the filmmaking process. And one thing. I learned as a first-time filmmaker, that first cut, you see, you want to slit your wrists. I'm like, it, it, I want to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge when I saw that shit. Oh, no, shit. don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's everything is a learning. It's a lot of learning process I had to go through. Yeah. So were you more motivated by the fact that when you figured out that you just didn't know certain things, were you more motivated to dive in a bit deeper, seek oh, out yeah. more help. Yeah. And Always. a bit of that imposter syndrome, did you find that it was kind of starting to fade away or did it get bigger by the time that you were done? I couldn't even focus on if it's getting bigger or not. I had to keep it going. Um, I had I would just focus on making sure the story was told right. I didn't, I didn't give a damn if anyone thinks if, you know, if I'm inexper inexperienced or not. I just had to make this shit because I had something to say. And if I distract myself, what I worry about what this person thinking of me, I, I, the project would have not gotten done. Yeah. So digging in a bit more with um, CJ's character, um, she was very fearless, um, but also she had a lot of heart and she just wanted a way to kind of change the thing that had yeah. happened. And in real yeah. life, we're always trying to change the past when, and we figure out that we can't. Yeah. So, with her, why was it so important to show that she had these very strong characteristics of being someone who just could not give up? Because in real life, we all have our dreams and goals and we're trying so hard to get somewhere, but why was it important to show that even towards the end, and we'll talk about the ending, that we have this very strong sense that this girl is just not gonna stop? What does that mean for you and to show that in this sense? I, wanna, I wanted her character to tell young black kids don't stop fighting for what you need to fight for. Mm -hmm. You gotta be unapologetic. You gotta be unapologetically black, especially with the safety of your family. Absolutely. That's that's the reason why I have her character like that. So. And it's not her fault that her brother died. Not at all. Not at all. I, have, I read a lot of think pieces and comments saying, well, the reason her brother died, so and so. No, the reason her brother died because racist ass cops didn't know how to control themselves. That's not on her. Cause and effect. Cause and effect that it's worse, actually. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the ending. So you, <laughs> I don't know about every, anyone here, but I just started making up theories and narratives and all kinds of stuff. And when I, when I found out I was gonna be moderating, I'm like, let me just ask you <laughs> why the ending? What was, what was the reason behind cutting the movie at, in the way that you did. Well, what are your interpretation of the ending? <laughs> so, I'm thinking that, like when I saw it, I just kept thinking to myself, first, would I be that person that just continues to run, right? Um, the answer is yes. Um, it's just the kind of person that I am. Um, for her journey, I feel like 
she's going to keep going back to the drawing board and figuring out how to make time travel more efficient so that it works not just in her favor, but so that she can right this wrong that they never had control over to begin with. Um, would there be a sequel? Uh, I don't know if I would go that far, but um, as far as her character is concerned. No sequel. No sequel. <laughs> um, as far as her character is concerned, my mind is telling me that she's just not gonna stop. The reason you know, I did the ending, obviously, is to open up a dialogue like, like what you judge you gave beautifully. Um, I didn't, I worked on the script for five years. I fought for that ending. Um, you know, a lot of, I, you know, it hurts when I'm reading articles and, and, and you know, tweets just calling me lazy. <laughs> um, you know, you know, saying it's a cop out and whatnot. I'm just like, you know, it's, you know, I'm not here to wrap a, a story in a bow. It's, but, you know, if, if I'm gonna be an artist, I'm gonna be an artist all the way. Um, but dealing with the subject matter, um, I needed to people to remind themselves this, you know, this is more than a movie. Um, it's still happening today and and um and I want people to do something about it. Right. Um so I thought of, you know, so many ways to end it and I chose this ending. Uh because if I were to show CJ saving her brother it will be a, an offensive oversimplification of the subject matter that I address in this film. That's a good point. Um, if I show her sacrificing herself or another black man or a black woman um, being killed in the process for her to save her brother, I'm telling the African-American audience, my people, there is no hope. So I, I strategically have her running towards the camera saying, I'm running towards you. Right. I need your help. Get your ass off the couch and do something about it. Let's chew on that for a second. <laughs> um, so it took you five years. You, be, you mentioned that literally just a moment ago. <laughs> are there other projects right now that are that have taken that long that we don't know about just yet. What are you working on right now? Wow, I want to keep you know in the and be on the train with you know black people, sci-fi action adventure. Um, and right now, I've teamed up with um, producer named Lord Levin. Uh, we did Die Hard, The Watchmen, Hellboy, The Rocketeer, and um, and we're doing a uh, black Indiana Jones movie. Ooh. Set in Ethiopia in the year 1928. And you can't give us any more than that. No more, really. Not an outfit, not a, Nothing. a hat. <laughs> 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 Nothing. <laughs> so in between projects, how do you stay motivated? Because you and I had a, a moment to talk beforehand, and um, I was just asking about, you know, do you have side projects, side gigs, hustles, those kinds of things? You're an artist, so I imagine you're obviously multi-talented. And you said to be something very key, something very interesting, and something I've heard from many people, which is, um, no, I'm a director, so I'm just gonna be focused on directing. For now, to my bank account. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. That's no, yes. I am. I'm hustling to you know get this project. I told you off the ground. Um, you know, the Black Indiana Jones film. Um, before I was able to do this film, I was working here um, at SAC After Foundation as a on, on camera lab technician. Wow. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was helping y'all. Y'all crazy. <laughs> nah, I love you. you know. So <laughs> you just got back from the Golden Globes. Yeah, yeah. And what was that experience like, being this kind of like first time director with a feature film that's now on Netflix 
to give us some insights there on how. Oh, I was trying to chase Lena Waithe around. Okay. <laughs> I was like, wait, see, I want to meet her. I want to meet her, and then <laughs> I couldn't get to. Uh, <laughs> now nah, it was fun. It was I was there, you know, to network and you know, you know, let people know who I am, and I, I met a lot of important people, people that we know and people that we don't know, and and it's it's very important, no matter if it's a Golden Globes or uh, or this event amongst yourselves, you network, you know. Ap, you know, after party at a um, at a film festival or a function, whatever, you know, always do your best to network, and that's what I was doing, just chilling. I love that. I love that. Again, another round of applause before we jump into questions here. Okay, so Rick Toscano. Hi, Rick. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm liking the jacket, by the way. You're welcome. Um, Rick's question, what was the hardest day on set and why? The hardest day on set was the first day of shooting. Um, we were trying to set up the camera, we were trying to set up the shot and whatnot, and, but there was garbage in the middle of the shot, in the middle of the street, because it's a one, it's a one take. Um, it's that first moment you, you see the cops coming out the car and telling them, you know, where the fuck you're going? Um, and, you know, okay, it took us, three hours for the first shot, because we had to get, our truck had to come from the Bronx, and we shoot in Brooklyn, and it, and it took the garbage away. So all right, we're gonna set up a shot. The first take was almost perfect. You know, it was a lockdown on the street, um, the police lockdowns, so, okay, great. You know, and I was about to call cut, and then my AD, cut, 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 cut. I said, like, yo, what's going on? Oh, Spike is coming. So Spike ruined my shot. <laughs> 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 and he came down the block, Parked his car, um, and he decided to watch the rest of the, of the scene. And once we got the scene, he come up to me, yell at me, "You cannot start the day late." <laughs> I was like, yo, 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 hey, thank you, you started it, and it was the, the damn trash. I was like, look, I was like, okay, Spike, thank you, and <laughs> and then he, then he left, then um, he, then he then he yelled at my DP about starting late too. Uh, <laughs> and that was the first and only time I saw Spike on, on, on set, so thank God. <laughs> so that was fun. But I, I needed that to, you know, start the film off right. Yeah. Nah, nah, that was on him. That was on Spike. <laughs> um, next question from George Field, the second? Or no, I'm sorry, the fourth? Hi, how are you? Good. Um, George's question, what do you like to see in an actor? Um, that's a tough question because, it, you know, every role is different. Um, there's no, I don't have a set rule. I just want to see, you know, just be, just be natural, just be cool. You know, come in ready for the role um, and come in, don't... Uh, my advice to actors is all, this all the time is that you don't want to come in thinking what the casting director or the director wants. You come in providing what you can what you can bring to the to the uh, to the to the character. Um, and believe it or not, that often I'm not sure if you guys agree with my advice or not, which is fine. But for me, I I you know I want to be challenged a little bit to. Okay, this actor did something different in this audition with the character. Let me bring them back to see what else they have. Um, I, you know, I, you know, trying to, ple you know, yes, you want to please the, uh, you know, the director or the casting director, but, you know, if you don't bring in your own thing to it that's also authentic to the character, don't get me wrong, um, you know, they could they could smell the funk or what from a mile away. So, just, just you know, just be grounded. <laughs> it stinks. <laughs> Last question, um, Michelle Zangara. Um, we kind of talked about this earlier in the interview, but I'm going to put a little twist on your question. The question is, what was the inspiration for your screenplay and time travel, as time travel has always intrigued her? But what about time travel outside of the premise of this movie is intriguing to you? Uh, I'm never gonna do it. <laughs> I have no desire for time travel, personally. Um, I never want to go back in time. I hate high school. 
So no regrets. No, no re regrets. Nah. Um, I think what's time travel is intriguing for me personally outside of film is just trying to learn about it. There's so many theories about time travel, like you know, the wormhole theory, the string theory, the multiverse theory. Um, it was it was difficult to learn, you know. And I promised myself this is gonna be the last time travel movie I do. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> it was like god damn <laughs> so last question um it's a two-parter first what would you like to tell current students that are in film school do a short film first um beside you know instead of trying to jump into making a feature if i mean there's rule there's exceptions to the rule um, and I've seen it, um, but you know, if you know you're not ready, don't force yourself to do it. If you know you're not ready, and when I try to do a f my feature film first, I was trying to do this as my thesis film, but my my professor said you're not ready, and and I appreciate that because that short film allowed me to learn how to be a director much better, right? And allow me to learn more about directing actors, and and writing, of course. So I wasn't ready. I'm glad I wasn't. And I'm glad, you know, someone told me I wasn't ready um, because a short film can give you a much more better success than you trying to do it in your own um, because it shows financiers and people that you're able, you know, to do something amazing. And you'd be surprised how quicker you can do your first feature film if you do a short film um, that's close to it. And... What do you want to see black actors take on going forward? Because there's a lot of different things happening on television and film. But if there was one or two, if there were one or two things that you'd like to see, what would those one or two things be? More scientists. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's that's the reason why um I did this movie and and you know um I, I just want to, you know, show, you know, more young black people, um, that there are more means to get out the hood and have a successful life besides being ball players or musicians. When I'm not saying that's not a bad thing, you know, that's not a bad attribute, but you know, there's too much of movies that keep showing us that way, and I don't want that. Um, so that's one role. Um, and we, I want to see more. Superheroes like a like a black Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's happening. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Thank, thank you. all of you for attending. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Give a round of applause for her, please. She's the